thank you. So um, we're going to open up the budget workshop. Uh, it is May 6, 2019, and I will turn the time over to Dr. Kinter. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Superintendent Graves, fellow administrators, members of the community. Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Philip Kenter. I'm the business administrator here at Sac Harbor. And uh, tonight we have our May 6th uh, final review of the adopted budget. And I'd just like to walk us through where we are. And uh, just a, a recap, many of these slides you've seen before. Uh, our budget development process every year. We focus on long-term sustainability and improvement. And we look to uh, sustain and possibly improve all of our educational programs while staying at or below the property tax cap. And uh, we look at the need for each expenditure. And then if it is needed, how we can obtain that item or that service at a lower cost uh, and or obtain the service through one of our shared services or cooperative purchasing programs. And as I've mentioned in previous uh, presentations, we uh, participate with pretty much all the contracts, New York State, Suffolk County, Suffolk Shared Services, BOCES, Educational Data, Nassau County, um, and that saves the district thousands of dollars. And uh, we also work with our neighboring districts to capture uh, savings as well. Uh, some of the savings that we've captured are outlined here, and um, some of the costs we've incurred, and how we've tried to uh, address those issues. And um, as every district faces, uh, we annually uh, are hit with unfunded mandates and expenses that we've uh, not been advised of. We find out after the budget, and, and we're required to implement uh, certain services or, or products. And, uh, so we, we have to build money into the budget for those types of things. And I've mentioned uh, an example of that would be when we had to do the water testing last year and uh, our management letter with all the changes that we uh, had to make in our corrective action plan. And uh, again, we, we attempt in every way possible to be as transparent as possible. All of the PowerPoint presentations that I've made are on our website. Uh, as is the budget in detail, line item by line item, with a detailed explanation and breakdown of all the costs associated with each respective line item. And that can be found here at this site, on our website. And uh, this page is an example of the adopted budget that you'll find on our website, which breaks everything down, uh, showing the years 2017-18 by budget and expenses. Our current budget, 1819, which is through June 30th of this year, and then what we've proposed, the dollar amount change, if there was a change, and the percentage change. And um, we were required to uh, make changes for this year so that our budget is broken down by building, and we're also in the process of changing our whole system over uh, in Finance Manager, which is our accounting software, to, uh, and that's happening this month to a new upgraded software called Envision. And in fact, uh, my staff and I will be going for a training with that uh, later on in the month. This slide, again, we've seen before, it takes our 2019-20 adopted budget by function, meaning general support, instruction, transportation, community services, employee benefits, debt service, and interfund transfers. Uh, the breakdown explanation is uh, listed below, and these, as an aggregate, uh, comprise our proposed budget of $42,885,375. This is a $1,004,000 increase over the current year, which is 2.4%, and uh, I might add that the current CPI is 2.44%. So we came in just below that. Adopted budget by object breaks it down again into the different <coughs> categories. And um, as noted below, 77.92% of our nineteen twenty proposed budget is salary and benefits versus 77.93% this current year. Um, another way of looking at our budget, and again, this slide has been presented uh, previously, uh, we break it into four components, administration program support, programs for students, employee benefits, and capital budget. And you'll note that employee benefits actually came down 
uh, in an aggregate of $398,000, primarily because TRS and ERS rates are proposed to be reduced for 1920. Every school dist district presents its budget in a three-part component. Uh, this is ours, the administrative component, which is the smallest component, representing $3.8 million or 9.07% is administrative, and that includes all the administrative functions of operating a $42 million school district. The program component, which is the largest piece, which is direct program to students, is $33,800,000, which is 79% of the budget. And then the capital component, which is the maintenance of your buildings and grounds, and um, debt service and any transfers to capital, a little over five million or 11.93 percent. <coughs> Bless you, and that represents 100 percent of our 42 million 885 375 proposed budget for 2019-20. This is uh, a report you've seen in the past. It's the, it comes directly from the New York State Controller's Office, uh, representative of Sac Harbor School District. Our trend report showing from 2014 to 2019 and um, what uh, our tax uh, cap has been, what we've come in at, what our tax levy has been. And uh, this is the worksheet you've also seen in the past. This, this worksheet uh, shows really uh, two numbers. One, the, uh, the total maximum tax levy that could have been imposed in Santa Carver, which was 4.56%. And that would have been a tax levy of $39,274,000. The board voted for a 3% tax levy of uh, representing $38,687,974. And that's $586,702 below the maximum tax levy. The impact of the 3% tax levy on the average uh, homeowner in both Southampton Town and East Hampton Town with a home uh, with an assessed value of $1 million, uh, we're looking at an increase in the East Hampton side of $150.75, or $12.56 per month. And on the South Hampton side, $136.60, or $11.38 per month. Uh, with reference to projected property tax rebates, we were informed by the two respective towns that for enhanced STAR in East Hampton, the um, rebate would be $528 and Southampton $541 and that's based on uh, qualified gross incomes which are listed uh, in this chart above. The adopted budget revenue, so this is how we're going to pay for this uh, $42 million budget. Uh, this breakdown shows uh, the budget, the current year's budget of 2018-19, uh, our budget of $41,888,96. And then right to the right of that, our 2019-2020 adopted budget of $42,885,375. We're expected to receive $2,004,000 from uh, New York State and state aid, $157,000 in payments in lieu of taxes. Uh, we're looking at non-resident tuition income of $1,033,000. Uh, charges for shared services and facilities usage. $415,416. Grants, interest, and other miscellaneous income, $117,000. The general fund tax levy at 3%, $38,687,974. We'll be appropriating $470,000 from our uh, employee reserve for uh, employee retirement system uh, reserve to balance the budget, uh, coming in at $42,885,375. And again, it's an increase of $1,004,479. It is a 2.4% increase. Another way of looking at uh, the budget, the revenue side, and financing uh, sources is this uh, very same slide. And uh, I also wanted to show our, all of our fund balances as of June 30, 2018, uh, each respective reserve our 4% unassigned fund balance, which is basically our savings account, and uh, the total amount that we have in reserves and assigned and, and appropriated or unassigned uh, fund balance. This is our current year's uh, activities, our, what was approved by the community. We are operating currently with a $41,880,896 budget. 
This was a budget to budget increase from last year of 4.95% with a tax levy limit of 4.02%, a tax levy increase of 3.51%, a tax levy of 37,561,140, and that was for the maintenance of all programs. So for 2019-20, we're looking at a $42,885,375 proposed budget. This is a budget to budget increase of 2.4%. Uh, the increase itself is $1,004,479. The tax levy limit was 4.56%. The board approved tax levy increase is 3%. The tax levy will be in, uh, posing upon approval would be $38,687,974. The tax levy limit that could have been imposed was $39,274,676. We are under the tax levy limit by 586,702, which is 1.56%. And I might note for the eighth year in a row, we are presenting a tax levy lower than the tax levy limit. This chart you've seen before it goes back to 2004, the tax levy budget results. And uh, this is uh, uh, part of the proposition number two that will be up uh, for the May 21st vote. Uh, the 2019-1500 series Chevrolet Fleet Suburban School Bus uh, with voter approval will be purchased out of the Transportation Fleet Capital Reserve at no additional cost to the taxpayers because we have that money in reserve already. And if I might just point out some of the benefits of purchasing this vehicle, uh, we're looking at a more cost-effective approach to trans uh, transport routes with lower student numbers, and a suburban can transport small groups of students, which are currently driven by a full-size school bus. Uh, and this would include transportation of BOCES programs, HB Ward Tech Center, Belfort Learning Center, uh, small groups of students with field trips, uh, New York Music Festival, and other club competitions. Um, the second point is utilizing this bus to transport students in hazardous conditions using a four-wheel drive is safer. Uh, supportive head buses with 19A requirement of observing drivers on routes, so our head, our lead drivers can go out in the field and observe the larger vehicles with this vehicle. Uh, included checking uh, road conditions and bus stops during snow or flooding conditions because this is a four-wheel drive vehicle. And this vehicle offers more options than standard buses uh, to safely evacuate students from an area due to flooding or other emergency situations. So the additional pr proposition on the ballot that the district is requesting authorization to purchase a 2019 Freightliner chassis Thomas body full-size school bus for a maximum cost of $103,524 and the 2019 1500 series Chevrolet Fleet Suburban school bus with four-wheel drive at a maximum cost of $74,900. And twenty-two dollars. And again, the funds for these respective purchases would be appropriate from the Transportation Fleet Capital Reserve Fund that was previously authorized by the public and was established for this purpose. And again, this purchase requires no increase in taxes. There will be no additional cost to the taxpayers because that money is already in the reserve. And uh, the funds have been set aside and they're safe for this type of a purchase. Uh, this is the budget notice that will be going out with the budget newsletter, and uh, it just breaks down again our current budget of forty-one million eight eighty-eight ninety-six, and uh, how that was arrived at. It breaks the three-part budget out into the three respective com components that I previously discussed: the administrative component, the program component, and the capital component, and also shows the tax levy. Right next to it, to the right is the budget proposed for 2019-20, the $42,885,375. It shows the $1,004,479 increase, which is 2.4%. It shows the change in consumer price index of 2.44%, so which is below that. It shows the proposed tax levy. Uh, it shows the three-part component. And to the right of that, we're required by law to put up what a contingency budget would look like for 2019-20 in Sac Harbor, and that number is 42,287,89, and uh, it's a 399,893 uh, decrease, and we've removed all capital equipment and uh, projects from that budget, with the exception of special ed equipment. 
Uh, the budget statement. Every year, school district is required to structure a uh, multi-component budget statement. And we've done that here in Sac Harbor. I've got a hard copy binder in each of the front offices of our two respective schools, the elementary school and here at Pearson. I have another copy on retainer uh, at the uh, John Germain Library. I have two copies in the business office. In addition to that, our director of technology was kind enough to have his staff scan the entire 167 page document in, and we now have it online with all the other budget documents uh, for easy access. And the budget statement is composed of the, uh, the budget in three part uh, format. But in addition to that, I've also uh, done something extra. I put the budget in showing the uh, last three year look back, and I've also put the budget in in the breakdown of the detail that's on the website. It shows the property tax report card. It shows our school's academic report cards, our, our district's fiscal accountability summary, the administration compensation notice, and the exemption reports for both the towns of Southampton and East Hampton. And I mentioned where the hard copies are located, and we're on the website with that. So what's left uh, tomorrow night I'll be making another presentation here uh, for the PTSA, and that's in conjunction with the Meet the Candidate site, and that's tomorrow, uh, that's tomorrow night here at 7 o'clock at Pearson in the high school auditorium. Next Monday night, May 13th, I'll be presenting this again, this presentation again for our budget hearing, which is required. I'm required to do that, so we'll do that next Monday night. That will start at 6.30 p.m. And then finally, on May 21st is the annual meeting, the budget vote, and the election. And I have another slide as a reminder to that. And again, this entire PowerPoint will be up uh, tomorrow morning on the website. And I want to thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Kemper at this time? Um, I have a couple. Some are related to transportation. Should we wait to the transportation conversation for that? It depends on if it's a question for him or for the transportation committee. Um, you know what? I, at least at least one of them will be for Phil. So thank you for that. Um, in an early slide, um, there's a bullet point that says um, our contracts have grown to over four hundred thousand in district revenue this year for central <coughs> transportation, which is great. Have we published? I'm trying to remember. Have we published what the profit on that is? I know we get in 400000 but what we actually, we obviously have costs related to that. Um, have we shared with the public actually what we're clearing on it? Because it really doesn't matter what you take in if it costs you more than what you take in. So I provided an, an estimate uh, to the Transportation Committee, but we won't know for sure until we close the books on June 30th and then we're audited. Right. So there's no even estimate that you can provide? I, I provided uh, that information to the Transportation Committee. All right, so we should so, hear that later then from so you guys. That's what, great. What we do with um, each year is, um, like, for example, when we started with Wayne Scott, we did an analysis of what um, the, we broke down pretty granularly. Here's the, what the cost of the bus drivers are right. according to the contract for that year. Right. Um, what we thought the operation of the buses were. Um, and then we gave projected costs, and then we did we did a profit margin, right. and then we we um, when we get to the end of the year, the auditors break that back down for us. Right. So if it goes more than that, we we will charge them more. Right. So and that there is a there's a balloon of you know if there's more, this will get a little bit bigger. Right. Um, the first couple of years it was actually contraction. We had over, we had we had been conservative when we overestimated. But we still said, here's the profit we have to make right. to make this. We're we're not looking to make money, but we're you know we're not looking we're not in the in profit business. But we have to we have to make a capture because there's administrative costs. There's there's work right. on our part, and we did we everything from how much um, wear and tear there was on the buses. So we did that to a granular level, and then each year we have to revisit it. Um, for, and and for we the should make are. a little if we're if we're. No, we're making right. Yeah. We're transporting in other There's districts, and they're paying us. We should make a little bit of a profit on there. And we, we are. just do it. Yeah. Otherwise, it just sucks up attention. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And then I was also wondering, and this was raised in the beginning of the cycle. It must have been January or February, uh, that was the first budget uh, presentation. But that was earlier in the year. Now we're you know eight, seven, seven weeks out of the end of the year. You know, in the past we've been able to see an estimate of year-to-date costs because. You can look at what you budgeted last year and say, okay, and compare it to this year, but what's, an act, what, what's in reality a much better view is 
what you estimate you're going to spend on that this year, and therefore what you might need next year. So I didn't know if there was anywhere where we could see that now that we're most of the way through the year. Um, well, we still have pretty much most of May and all of June still. Right, but we're still, you know, we're 85% through. I know in the previous, you know, the budgets in previous years, we got, we got to look at that, so I just didn't know if that was something we could look at before the vote. So you're looking for a year-to-date expenditure of the, in the treasury? If it doesn't year. exist, I'm going to ask me to create it. I just didn't know if there was estimates because, like I said, in previous years, we, we had an estimate compared to what we're right. budgeting for next year. Right. So I didn't know if that existed. So I, pre I provided that as of the date that that presentation was made, which I think was February 12th right. or something like that. Right. And, uh, I mean, if, if we need it, we could certainly do an update, but I would... I would uh, just look at that and, and assume that you can take another quarter and add it on? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Kinder. Thank you. Um, because that was a short uh, presentation, um, I'm thinking maybe we can just move straight into the meeting. Any objections? Okay. My, my only concern is that... There may be people coming to the meeting. I mean, I'm not saying you wait 30 minutes, but I think people are coming thinking that at 7.30 they're going to be able to be part of the meeting. So we should just anticipate there may be people who will be disappointed that they've missed some, some of the, the material being covered. Okay, so at this uh, time, if everybody's joined the meeting online, I'd like to get a motion to open the um, Board of Education meeting. Does it make sense to kind of flip the order so that the presentations, the consent agenda, you know, the presentations we do later so that the people are coming for that? Well, let's open the comments. meeting. Can I get a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Second. Thank you. All right. It's a small consent agenda, so it's kind of maybe it's a moot point. Um, I'm sorry. Do we have a first and second? Yes. yes. First was Brian, second was Susan. Susan oh. L. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I sent all my emails that way now. Yeah. We should have. We should be feeling yeah. about in this email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to move into the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, it's not because it's screen free week at the elementary that I actually don't have any explicit slides, but I thought <laughs> I would try that because I, for, for once I don't have slides, um, I think for the first time in five years, um, because I want mine are just conversational in nature. One is an update because I did get emails from about five parents that were very concerned over the weekend about the basketball courts. I responded to all of the basketball court in the back. I responded to all five with an update because um, uh, next next week is our um, uh, our business meeting where we get updates from from each of our um, cabinet members, from the uh, principals, and from 
our facilities director, but there's been a lot of concern with it being springtime in the basketball court and potential safety concerns around it. Um, but our facilities director, Paul Wilkin, has been very proactive. He's ordered padding to go around the um, poles, around the basketball courts, like we have at the elementary now, with the new multi-purpose courts. Those have padding, so we'll mirror that same padding. He's ordered um, for resurfacing of the basketball court. We'll also add uh, repainting of the lines. And we're also going to keep an eye on just the, the numbers of kids that are, because uh, we at, um, at lunchtime, we always have teachers out that monitor outside. So we'll keep an, an eye on that the number of kids don't over on the basketball court. We can't do anything about after school. If kids are, you know, you know a lot of kids uh, populate the basketball court. Um, but I don't think that's the concern parents had. I think they had the concern that so many children playing basketball um, at, at one time, you know, on the basketball court. But I think the real concern was, you know, the surface of the basketball court, that it's properly lined, and that there's padding around those poles, because that's what we now have at the multi-purpose court. And they've seen that kind of what good looks like, and they want to see that same thing mirrored here for the high school students and middle school students. So I, my thanks to Paul Wilkin for getting busy around that. Because, um, you know, if you've ever remodeled a house and suddenly you added brand new carpeting, you know, you start looking at that couch and it doesn't look as good. So the same thing is true with safety items. When you really enhance the safety of, like, the multi-purpose court, like we have, all of a sudden this doesn't look very safe anymore. So, um, you know, congratulations on uh, to Paul for getting being so proactive. And that, you know, voice goes out. If you could please let um, folks know that he, he and his fabulous team are working on that. The second item that is, um, I'm really looking for the will of the board on this is um, for the Stella Maris, we talked about phase two, and one a part of phase two has been um, in conversations with the pre-K and with the daycare um, is, and I think this was brought up uh, uh, at the last board meeting, was that the auditorium does not have safety in it, uh, which is, um, what would they call the old gymnasium. So I would like to ask for uh, the will of the board to move forward for the gym, for, th for really three items in the, in the uh, Sag Harbor Learning Center, um, for, for us to move through that part of phase two in the gym. Remember, the Sag Harbor Learning Center, we were bringing it up to New York State Department of Educational Standards for the educational part of the center. So we are we are building beautiful um, classrooms for pre-K and for daycare, um, and that is going to be perfectly safe. It's going to have a beautiful playground. It's actually going to have one of the rooms that's dedicated for indoor play space. But the gym, right now, was phase two, and that includes safety doors, um, safety. Um, uh, cameras that we are, we've gotten used to, so like that you have to swipe into those doors, that those doors are locked, that we have cameras, that we have technology connections so that the person in the safety office can be watching all the time. Um, it also really requires a new floor and a new roof and new lighting. Um, and so those things come at a cost. I don't have that cost, I can have it for you next week, but that's a tremendous amount of work for our team to do. Um, so I'm looking for the will of the board for, for those items. So that includes so all the safety doors, safety cameras, technology connections, um, the new, a new, I shouldn't say roof, new ceiling and, and, and flooring, um, which, you know, I'm going to say this and, and people will balk, is not as expensive as we think because we would go with the same gymnasium floor that they have in the elementary. Um, which is a, is a beautiful and sturdy thing. Um, and how would we fund that? We, this is a very tight year. We don't have lots of extra funds. It, it's just one of those years that we, we didn't have a lot of retirees this year. We didn't, have, um, we didn't have the captures that we've had in other years. So I can't come to you and say we have that funding. What we do have this year is we, have, we had a lift of um, over three hundred thousand dollars in tuition in, I can't utilize that money because if I utilize that money, that is over the voter approved forty one million dollars. So we can only spend in our budget as much as we have voter approved. And it again is a tight year. It's one of those years where you want to have at least two percent left over at the end of the year. So we're running in close. So 
I, my suggestion to the board is that we use some of our unassigned fund balance, and I can tell you how much of that unassigned fund balance next week that I would, would that, that we were required to get these items done to make this gym a beautiful place for pre-K and for daycare children to play in every day that's safe with safe doors, cameras, safety lockings, all the unlocking mechanisms, all that, um, by utilizing this unassigned fund balance, and then at the end of the year when the auditors close up the books, we can use the tuitioning in money, which is surplus, to uh, reinstate the, uh, the 1.6 million, money we, the monies we take from the limit. But again, that's an awful lot of work, and I would need the will of the board. We, I'll re, I'll bring this all back to you again next week, but again, that's an awful lot of work for us all to do, to go find out the contractors, the prices, the amounts, and then all of you look at me and go, we're not really interested in that. The children have plenty of room to play. They can go on that nice, safe playground. They can go in that nice, safe playroom that you have. We can just, we can wait until next year to do that. I just feel a little sense of urgency if anybody read the new newspaper this week. <laughs> so... All right, so open the floor for discussion. Can the board have any questions for the superintendent? Um, I, I do. No. Oh, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. Okay, I, I actually, um, I have a question on this, and then I have, but I'd like to back up, because I actually have a question on the court. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that it's going to be resurfaced, because I was one of the parents that saw it after it was raised here and was a little alarmed. But the thing that um, really jumped out at me were the uh, rusted bolts that are sticking up in the base. And so is there something that's going to be done to cover that? We have padding. Actually, actually as we speak, this padding around it. That's going to, so that and it'll be somebody, if they fall on those bolts. Because actually, I was just at Shoreham over the weekend for a tennis tournament that our Pearson kids are playing in. And um, they had a very nice, smooth surface on their court <laughs> in the back. And they had the pads around the thing. And I looked down for the bolts, and there were no bolts. Uh, in fact, they were in. They, the, the poles were in the ground without any bolting, so I don't know how they did that, but it was nice and clean. So anyway, I'm just glad to hear that that will be addressed. It is. Okay, so that was my first question. Um, the second question on what you're asking us. So um, obviously we're not seeing documents, and again, I thought, <laughs> this goes back to some of the confusion we've had around this project. Remember when we put money in before the bond started and um, I believe initially it was a million, and then I think it was more than that. And one of the things that we were told is that money was spending for, you know, you, you said we had already had to, the bond was bringing us up to New York State standards, but then some of the issues surrounding safety had changed, and so that was what part of the money was going to, for as well as for the, for, the, for the All for the educational link. All for the okay, educational so it's just, it's a, I find it a little confusing because when I hear we're bringing the building up, I'm assuming it's the whole building. So if it's just the one side of the building and not the other. So I just, for me, I just, I, are you asking us whether the approval <coughs> on going to do the work and compile and come back? You're not asking us to approve no. these items? No, Oh, okay, okay, great, no. thank you. Okay. Nope, nope. Then that was, no. Nope. Then I'm very happy, nope. thank you. Okay. So I, okay, we, we, we it. talk about it? Yeah, <laughs> and, then we, and we get to see it. Yeah. Okay, good, yep. good, good. But okay. it's a lot of work. I get it. It's get a lot it. of work. Yep. So I, yeah. we're going to talk about it, and then you're going to see it, and then you can decide on it. And then, I mean, the gym floor. I mean, I guess we can come back to that. But again, I recall hearing that the floor was fine when we purchased it's, the building, it's, but not it's, for it, you know varsity games or something. So, and and it is fine. But what we're going to find out is that long term, it's uh, under. It's got a little bit of cupping. Go, kids can play, big kids can play on it all day long, but if we're going to go in there and we're going to start poking holes and everything for for cameras and for technology drops and all that, we're going to have to abate for asbestos. Let's just redo the floor for little children. You know, let's just make it make it great so it's beautiful. Brian, you have a question. The floor is great, but long term. It was more of a. I think they're wonderful ideas, but I I just think until we have information, it's premature to have the discussion. Was my opinion on that. Like, we don't know how much, what the scope, what like, so, we have that information. I think so, the ideas as a concept sound great, but without information. So if it's a hard no right now, like, no, we're not spending any more money, that's enough. If it's a hard no, I won't go forward. But if I if I gather all the information, if, if it's a, I, I'm receptive, I'll go do all that work, I'll work all those nice 14 hour days my family doesn't like, and I'll come back next, next week and you'll have it by Thursday or Friday to look at. And then we can have I a think discussion. She just I, I asked the same question you were asking. 
So, in other words, what she's asking is approval yeah, for her to go to the mall. Oh, okay. Yeah. She's yeah. just trying to get the feel yeah. for like if we're all going to say no way, don't don't even bring us phase two. We don't want to see it. Then it doesn't make sense for her to try to gather. All I think those it's numbers. smart to get the information and yeah. then make a decision based on the information. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a point of clarification. So, if the work wasn't done, would the gymnasium be up to New York State standards? For children, for children of this age to use, they could, yes, they could use it, but it wouldn't have the safety mechanisms that would make me, as a superintendent, feel comfortable letting them play in there. Because without the safety, we've gotten to the level where we gotta have locked doors and cameras. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I could sleep at night. Okay. I'm only asking because it has, when the, it has New York State. It, yes, right. I'm only asking because when we discussed this early in the year. It wasn't positioned to us that we we really need will need to do phase two before we open. So I just feel like, you know, we bought the house and now we're being told we have to spend more money to get the garage so, at the house. So, so I'm, I'm so, so it's just so and, and it, I don't think it's deliberate, but but I'm so nervous to, uh, about this project. The last time we had a presentation with with numbers and data was January, and we're supposed to open in three and a half months. And I, you know, I've been a pain asking, like, when are we getting this? When are we so, getting this? And so I don't know if we should even look at phase two until we haven't looked at our current numbers and timeline for phase one in a long time. So all of the bids have come under mm -hmm. under budget, knock on wood. All the bids came under budget. So that's 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 where we are right now. Um, but our daycare providers that we have been discussing with, leasing the space mm -hmm. with, were like, we're not comfortable sending children into a gymnasium that don't have security doors. And so the doors are great, but people have changed their philosophical, you know, they want to see the cameras, they want to see the door locks, they want to see those things. Mm -hmm. So we, it's fine, we do have wonderful play spaces for the children. It's just people have gotten, and so have I. I don't sleep well at night. Mm -hmm without that level okay. of security. So so we, we there's just a greater emphasis on finishing this sooner versus later. Can we can we at the next meeting also get an update on expenses and timeline that we know to date. It may be arranged because we but you know if we've come in lower that's great. Yeah. I just feel like it's been so long and the public should have this information. They should know. No, when we set the agenda we'll we'll we haven't set the agenda for next week so okay. we'll take that into consideration. Okay. Any other questions for the board? From the board? I'll just add, um, since you're asking for the will of the board, I have a question just to add my two cents. Is I'm definitely <coughs> up for seeing that information. I kind of feel like one, you know, phase two has always been something that was planned. Whether it was now or later, it's, it's phase two. It's a phase of the project. Um, and I like the idea of doing it earlier for a number of reasons. One of them being that since we're going to be looking at your letter of resignation, I think having you see this start to finish is really important. It's going to be helpful to have that continuity to get Sag Harbor Learning Center done. Two, I think it's a great idea to rip the Band-Aid off if we can afford it so that when we open Sag Harbor Learning Center, it's done, you know, or maybe we still don't have a kitchen, but it, there isn't a big part of it that's kind of still out there and there's gonna be construction going on with kids in it and, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm all for it. Um, obviously, we can see the numbers. But. Um, I thought the kitchen was part of phase two, is it not? Yeah, the kitchen's all going to be done. Every part of it's going to be done, but we're not going to have the commercial, every piece of the commercial equipment in. The only thing you're going to have is your range. Every oh, so as far as like a construction, the kitchen doesn't need much. It's more just, it's a just purchasing it, appliances and yep. them themselves. Okay. Commercial appliances. Commercial <laughs> But that, I thought but I that thought was part of phase two. That plumbing. I thought we just looked at that plumbing. Yeah, that's for their fittings. They're putting all the plumbing fitting. But then they had, the di the, but they had in that contract it said um, a kitchen add, and there was another forty-four thousand dollars. That's, so that's then, what they call an add alternate. So let's say we have we have a twenty percent. But then they had that in the total at so, the bottom. So it's an it's an add alternate. So when let, we have a twenty percent contingency, if things go really really well, we may have the funds to purchase all the commercial equipment. The, and get that all it'll all be done and so then that contractor has that ad, ad alternate in there that they will then hook those up okay so so we don't pay them that if that i had asked this question via email and you know um 
uh, was whether, I was a little confused whether that forty four thousand. So that does not include the full pr so commercial that's kitchen. What they, that's what they call it. Oh, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Okay. So the the bid that we just got to look through, right, and had the ad alternate, but then they had it included with the forty four thousand, and then it had it included in the bottom line. So what I was unclear on is whether that. 44 meant that then we're getting the commercial kitchen or is that just to do the basis of the kitchen and then we'll need a more money to buy more equipment or did that include so, equipment so that that's an app so that's an ad alternate if we get to the end of the project and there's so there's a scope of a bond you don't refund anybody any money on a bond so if you get to the end of the bond and you're still under budget these are things that you can continue adding on and and finishing the project. So should we get to the end of the bond project, one of the ad alternates is that we would purchase the commercial equipment and the plumbers would would hook up that. That's that's their part of the ad alternate. Okay, so maybe this is one of the reasons we find it's confusing. So we're approving that, but that doesn't mean they're doing it. That doesn't mean they're doing it. Okay. And it's not really spelled out what that 44 right, that's means. why I in, asked the in question. In the paperwork yeah. we have, it doesn't spell out yeah. this right. 44 will cover. So yeah, I so assumed that it that just says kitchen fit up. Really so what does that mean? mean? I assumed it was just for the plumbing since it's just a plumbing. It's just yeah, it's yeah, so right, but when it said add alternate, because I thought again that the other phase that we had all approved was including the basic pieces of the kitchen, but not the commercial part of the kitchen. Right. So when I saw the phase two add alternate, I thought, okay, does this mean this is commercial kitchen? You know, it is a commercial kitchen. Yeah, it's not a functioning not, commercial it's not, kitchen. Right. It's not a functioning. Yeah. It's not a commercial kitchen if you don't have appliances to do anything with it. Then it's set up to be a commercial kitchen at some future date. Potential. Future but it's not It's not a commercial kitchen if it has pipes. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Discussion? All right, sounds like we have uh, the green light to gather some more numbers so that the board can. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so that's it for the superintendent's report. So now we'll move in the transportation committee report. I got you. Hello there. <coughs> and we have somebody making copies. She's yeah, gonna she bring got Oh, she got them? Yeah, okay. they're, they're on there. Okay. Yeah, so if anybody wants hard copies of the presentation, it's here. Um, so I am on the transportation committee. And um, we have been meeting. Most of my committee members are here. Thank you for coming. Um, and we were charged with um, coming up with some creative ways to look at busing so that um, possibly we can reduce some of our costs. So also part of this presentation, um, we'd like to clarify some things for the board and the public, um, some common misconceptions that we've seen, um, just to help alleviate some <coughs> confusion. So I did want to just back us up. We did have a bus fleet repla replacement reserve fund it was created in 2010. It was capped at $400,000. By June of 2016, the balance on that account had already met its cap, and then it had some interest included, so it was $401,223. When Jennifer Bashami was here, um, she was developing a long-range plan, and um, this is a direct quote from her presentation on November 21st, 2016. She said, the district's intermunicipal municipal agreement to provide transportation services to Wayne Scott will, will result in additional revenue each year. These sh funds should not be used to fund reoccurring expenses, but instead should be set aside in a new transportation fleet replacement reserve to pay for future bus replacement costs. So, in 2017, the voters established a transportation fleet capital reserve capped at $2 million, and by June 30th of 2018, um, the balance on that account was $2,003,539 because of the interest. So that um, account is already capped out. Um, this is the um, reserve fund that the voters will vote to have the two vehicles purchased from. So. This is not going to add to um, the taxes. We've set that money aside for this purpose. Um, we also wanted to um, 
just kind of illustrate for everybody what we are legally obligated to provide just because we have residents in Sac Harbor. And so we made a list. Um, we do five runs per building in the morning and five runs in the afternoon. We have various daily sports contests. We also have sheriff's shared sports agreements with four different sites. So we are sending children to East Hampton Middle, East Hampton High, South Hampton High, the Ross School. We also transport students to six different BOCES sites all over Long Island. Holtzville, Port Jeff, Bellport, West Hampton, Eastport, Riverhead. Um, there's an AM run and a PM run to Riverhead, so those, that's two runs. They go to Ross Lower, they go to Ross Upper, they go to Hayground, they go to Our Lady of the Hamptons, and Southampton Montessori. So these are all the places that we are legally obligated to transport our students. <clears throat> Several years ago, we used to subcontract all of this work. Um, before my tenure on the board, we started purchasing buses and trying to get as much of this done in-house as we could. Um, the budget to get all of this done for last year was set at a little more than 1.4 million. And some of that we do in-house and some of that is subcontracted. So I also wanted to run through last year um, which runs were subcontracted. So there are four afternoon runs at the middle high school. And we have the cost of that, which is about $318,000. Um, they do some of our sports runs, some of our field trips. Um, and they do two of our BOCES runs. So the total subcontracted, our estimate for 2018-19, we expect to be just north of 417,000. So we did, as a committee, ask the um, business department to really look at those numbers closely because what we budget is usually very conservative. That number will be a little bit larger because sometimes we don't know where the students will need to be bused until we're into the school year. So in the budgeting process, we'll, we'll make sure that budget line has plenty of money. Um, that's not what this number is. That's not what we budgeted for that. What this is, is we ask the business department to go back and say, hey, it's almost the end of the year. How much do we think it'll cost if we kind of see this through to the end of the year? And that's the estimate that they gave us. So that's a little bit better estimate than um, the budgeted amount for the subcontracted number. Um, the other thing that we wanted to clarify is that um, aside from everything that we're legally obligated to provide for our residents, we also subcontract, we are a subcontractor for other districts. So for example, um, other districts pay us to provide transportation for all of their destination for their residents regardless of where those students are going. This has nothing to do with our tuitioning in students necessarily. For example, Wayne Scott pays us to transport their students to Wayne Scott Schoolhouse as well as Sag Harbor and East Hampton. This is a net revenue for the taxpayer. Here are the current contracts that we have for the year that we are in. So the revenue off these contracts is just over 415000 The projected expenses to fulfill those contracts is roughly 236750 so we will have a net profit, if you will, of about $179,000 with a profit margin of roughly 43%. All right, so now we wanted to get into the options. Should we wait to the end to ask questions? Do you have questions on anything you've seen so far? Um, yes. The, um, I hope the slides are, are number the transportation subcontracted sub slide that says 4 p.m. runs, sports and field trips, those. Mm -hmm. Can you just share, or does anyone, first of all, thank you to the committee. You've done a, a lot of work, obviously, and it's, so far I'm, I'm impressed with what you're sharing, so thank you. Um, what of these are new this year? Because I understand that our costs have been driven up by transportation, partially because of later start time shift. And I'm just curious, what of this was kind of added this year? Well, one of the things that's really difficult for us to compare from year to year is how the costs change from one year to the next. Um, the more that we talked about it, the more we realized it's, it's, it's like a shell game. Because if we need one more run over here, there's this rippling effect that moves everything else right. over somewhere else. So the 4 p.m. runs are probably the biggest indicator of the change in the start time. But as far as... Um, sports and field trips and things like that. Right now, we're doing more 
sports runs in house because we're subcontracting out the PM runs. So mm -hmm. if we were doing the PM run, then we would have to subcontract out the sports run. So mm -hmm. you know, there's only so many buses and so many drivers. We cover as much as we can, and then what we can't cover, we subcontract out. Right, but I know that like the, the PM runs are the you need the big buses for those, generally speaking. So I'm assuming we're Either way, we'd have to subcontract them out because we can't have the same drivers do the double run like we could a year ago, right? Yes. That's what we were told at a previous meeting. So one yes. could assume the four p.m. runs. I don't think last year we were subcontracting out our p.m. runs at all. Correct. Okay. So so that's kind of the big bucket that was the impact. Right. Okay. Oh, Thank and that reminds you, you want me to come on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if Maude were here, what she'd say is the reason they did the four p.m. runs is they wanted continuity of the children always seeing the same face every day. That that's really important that you see this thing and what face. we're seeing this year is that isn't always necessarily the case yeah. Well. yeah just been learning through experience from our from our provider that that's we're not getting consistent I'm just to make sure i just where we are okay okay right there okay diana i just had a yeah. really quick question about your the slide or oh, this slide that you mm -hmm. have no i'm sorry the one that says transportation contracts the revenues and projected expenses and the profit margin one this one uh yes so just out of curiosity, so when you say projecting expenses here, does that like reflect the hard expenses in terms of, you know, the bus drivers, gas, etc., and not necessarily reflect the administrative costs in implementing this, or does that include all of that? Um, I don't think administrative costs were in that, but it was definitely even stuff like depreciation on the bus and the oh, maintenance okay. and wow. the payment into their retirement plans and like like every little nitty gritty detail. Okay, great. Yeah. So it's fully loaded. Yes. Good. Yes. Okay, we have Maude on the phone. Can oh, I want to clarify you? Yeah. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Maude. Hi. So um, just so that everybody's aware, I have, Maude Stevens is our director of transportation, and she couldn't be here tonight. And so um, I've asked her to be with us on the phone so that if there were questions that came up that uh, that I or the committee couldn't answer, um, then we could have them on answer them for us. Yes. Diana, can I just um, pause you for one minute? I have a feeling that the, it's possible the people that have just walked in might be here for the basketball court. So do you want to ask that? And if that's the case, do you want to make an announcement? So they can leave. So that they can go. Oh, we had a huge influx of people. Is there yes. something yes. you're here? See all these kids yes. and parents have just arrived. Should I give them my, really? my update really quick? Karen, I already gave an update that, um, um, and I'll go back over it. Um, that because I got so many parents reached out to me over the weekend in the last four days, that our director of facilities would be giving an update next week normally because this is an educational meeting. We just talk on special topics. But he's already at um, ordered the padding to go around the to match the padding that we have at the elementary, um, the surfacing material, the painting, and um, his crew is going to be working on that. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the padding's already arrived, right? Well, no, that's just temporary padding. That's that temporary, we but we have, we've ordered, we ordered the padding. The we ordered the padding that'll match. We, we have a little stuff to do it, but the weather hasn't cooperated lately, so we're yeah. waiting for a few dry days. Yeah. And the other thing we're going to be working on is making sure that during the lunch times that that our teachers are monitoring that there's not too many kids on there. We can't do anything about after school, but that during the lunch times and everything that they monitor it. So we're on it. And I, I do want to shame the new multi-purpose court because that 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 basketball court has looked that way for quite a while, but as soon as you make that be new beautiful court, now you really want it to match that. And that's what we're going to work towards. Um, so I want to give a lot of credit to Paul Wilkin who um, who did that? All that ordering. So our director of facilities is, is is on it. He's got the safety pads. He's got the resurfacing and the painting. Um, so he's on it. So um, you guys are all welcome to have a seat. There's another public input at the end of the meeting. He's got it. He said he's just he's just waiting on the weather. Yeah. So could be the bottom line is it's going to be all fixed up. Um, I'm not convinced. Oh, okay. Okay, so you're welcome to speak. I appreciate what you said, but I'm I, okay. I'd still like to speak. Okay. So yeah. make yourself at home. All right, so um, at this point, we'd like to go through the options that the committee has put together for um, the board's consideration. Um, and before we do that, um, there are some things, some context that we wanted to just educate the board. Um, the first is that the way that our runs are set up right now, it's a 45-minute run. So you need a 45-minute 
lead time in between either start time or dismissal times of the schools to run two separate runs. Um, New York State strongly recommends that we do not allow our buses to back up. Um, by law, buses are, um, cannot idle in the bus zones at school. Um, our big buses do have heat, but they don't have air conditioning. And the reason we added those two bullets is because when you think about the loading and unloading of students or students waiting for other students to get on and those sorts of things, we can't idle. So it's just something to take into consideration. Um, the bus routes are determined by ridership, but we must cover the whole district. We never know who's going to get on a bus any morning. Um, we certainly know who's on our bus when they're headed home. Um, so if we know that we don't need to do a specific part of a loop, that's fine. But in the morning, we do have to cover the whole district. Um, by practice, we don't let students cross the street. So for example, um, if one of our bus drivers is heading up 114, heading towards the ferry, and there's a student with a house on the opposite side, even though it's New York State law that we put our flashers out and we stop and everybody's supposed to stop so the kids can cross, we know that not everybody does. And so we don't feel it's safe to have kids darting across 114 or Ferry Road or Noyak Road or any of these things. So we design our routes so that if they are, uh, if their house is on the right side of the road, that then we'll let them get off. But if their house is on the left side of the road, um, they have to stay on and, and come around till it's on the other side of the road. That being said, um, parents can ch change, pick up, or drop off locations by contacting the transportation park department. So if um, your child has a care provider somewhere else on the route or, or those sorts of things, those are always arrangements that can be made. Has that been communicated to the, to the parents? I don't remember seeing an email about letting them know because I think there's misperception about that. That's why we added it. No, no, I know it's here, but not everyone might see the presentation, go online and look through the entire That's presentation. About, what, about which piece? Well, just about that if they want to change their bus drop off or pick up, they just need to contact the transportation department. Because I think that would be, uh, there, there, are, there are many parents who have um, misinformation about that. And so the way to clear it up would just be to just send a simple email or something. Mm -hmm. But I'm just suggesting, I think it might be helpful to parents to know that. All right, so we're going to walk through the options. Um, the first option is to not do anything. Right? So this kind of just lays out what we're currently doing. Um, I've got the start times for the elementary and the high school, and then I have the um, lag time in between the two. So you've got an hour in between the start times and 34 minutes between the end times. Because of that 34 minutes with a 45 minute requirement, um, that is why we have um, four of our afternoon runs being contracted out um, with a subcontractor. So. Uh, we have five runs at both buildings. We run all of our AM runs in-house, but our PM runs, we run one of those ourselves and four of them are subcontracted. So um, at the bottom of each slide, you'll see kind of like the pros and cons, the perks, no change. Um, that's always convenient. Um, something to take into consideration. Um, right now, those four runs, um, we project that it'll cost about 318000 $347.74. So that's optioning. Um, one of the things we thought about, uh, and one that I was personally really excited about, was the idea of changing the elementary start time to 15 minutes earlier. That gives us that 45 minute lag time in the AM um, and brings the PM close enough that the idea is, well, what if we just pick up the kids at the high school and then go over to the elementary school and then pick up the kids and we'll just do one run which all sounds lovely until you get the, uh, the uh, head of transportation and go, let's say, yeah, you can do that, but let's just think that through. Um, and there were some things that she pointed out to us. Um, one is that with more students riding the bus, we would need to do more runs. So we do five runs with one building and five runs with another. If they're all going to run it together, we can't do it in five runs. It would take at least eight runs. So it's not twice as many, but still, that means we'd have to have um, three more, she estimated three more buses and three more drivers to make that happen. Um, the other thing that um, she and one of the, our committee members that uh, drives bus um, pointed out to us is that dismissal is very different at the middle high school than it is at the elementary school. So at the middle high school, the bell rings, everybody floods out, they all get on the bus, those buses are rolling pretty soon after the final bell. In the elementary school, 
they're lining up, they're, they're coming out in single file, they're doing it by grade level. It takes a lot longer for elementary school students to load than it does for middle high school students to load. So what happens is because these end times are 20 minutes apart, the high, middle high school kids are going to get on that bus in, a, in about five minutes and then they're going to go over to the elementary school and they're going to have to wait for them to dismiss and then they're going to have to wait for them to load. And we can't idle in zones, so in the summer that's really hot and in the, win the winter that's really cold. And so the more we talked about it, the more we were like, well, I'm not as excited about this idea as I thought I was. So um, some other considerations with this particular option is that if we have eight buses out all at the same time, um, we don't even have enough room in our bus loops to have eight buses at the same time. So we might even have to do like just loading buses in phases because you've got four buses in and then you've got to wait for four more buses to come up and then those kids, like, there's some logistical concerns there. Um, we would need to figure out where to park those buses at night. Um, we might have to park them at the elementary school, the middle school, things like that. So. Um, and then one other thing that was brought up in the committee meeting is that if kids are seeing one bus driver in the morning and a different bus driver in the afternoon, for little kids that might be confusing. The high school kids and middle school kids could probably figure it out, um, but that might be confusing for um, the little guys. So once we've talked about this more and more, um, we thought, well, I don't know if it makes a whole lot of sense to vet whether this would save us money or not because we're buying more buses and getting more drivers and it might be a, a net wash at the end of the day, um, but it is something that we had talked about, so we wanted to bring it to the board as an option. If you want us to explore further and see how much it would cost, we're welcome to do that, but we wanted to show you some other things that we came up with as well. Um, next, we thought, well, what if we added another run to the um, homebound run at the middle high school? Would that make us be able to decrease the lag time from 45 minutes down to like 35 minutes. Would that help? Um, and it turns out, yeah, that would actually make a big difference. So if uh, we continued with the five runs in the morning at both buildings, but then did six runs in the afternoon at the middle high school, that would shorten those runs enough that we could get back to the elementary school to pick up those kids. So we were thinking, okay, well, how much would that save us? And again, it's a really tough number to pin down. It's not the full $318,000 that we're subcontracting out for those four runs because we would not be able to do as many of our sports runs. So then we'd have to subcontract out those sports runs. Um, but Maude assured us that um, subcontracting out sports runs is less expensive to the district than subcontracting out the homebound runs. So it would save us money. We, we really tried to estimate what that would be. We think it'll be somewhere around $200,000 to $235,000 is what we could save if we did that. Um, but again, it's really, really tough to pin down the number because we don't even know what our busing needs will be for next year. Um, but again, some things to take into consideration. That extra bus is going to put um, one more bus out on the road, which is a little bit harder as far as loading, and there's like some safety and logistical concerns that we, um, that we had. Uh, so that's an option. Um, the committee also liked the idea of just changing the middle school, high school start time back a little bit. That was based on the recommendation of the, um, the consultant. That would give us our 45 minutes in between. And again, it's not the full 318 that we would save because we would take the afternoon runs and then we'd have to subcontract out more sports runs. Um, but at least we'd have the same, uh, we would be doing those in-house runs at the end. Um, it is kind of going a little backwards. We tried to go to later start time, and this is kind of going the other direction, but it is an option. It's definitely an option. Um, and then, then even after that meeting, we were shooting emails around. It's like, well, what if we did the elementary school even later? Why don't we do that? Like, we're constantly thinking outside the box. Um, and that would work as well. So if the elementary started at 9, that would give us that extra 45 minutes in the afternoon as well. But the thing to consider there is a later dismissal time for the elementary school means that those kids are getting dropped off later um, and it's getting dark in the winter time. Uh, it's just something to consider. Um, and then, okay, well, what if we started the elementary 
start time 25 minutes earlier and added a run, now we're starting to get into some, um, this is very similar to that shared run in the afternoon. Some of those logistical reasons still exist. Now it's not 20 minutes between, it's only 10, but again, we've got more buses, more drivers. Is it really gonna save us money? I don't know that it will. Um, so we came up with lots of options. Um, when we went around the table and tried to get kind of the consensus of the um, committee, we were split. Um, there was definitely some ideas that we thought were kind of a no-go, um, but we were split on, I. so our recommendation is that we either change the middle school, high school start time 10 minutes earlier, or we add one run to the high school, middle school in the afternoon. I think both those two options were our favorites. The other ones didn't seem like they were making much of a big difference. Um, the other thing that we wanted to um, tackle for you guys is um, we have had um, people come to the board talking about the um, private school transportation. If you recall, we are not legally obligated to um, provide transportation for private school students when school is closed. And so while we had MOD there and bus drivers there and, and we kind of vetted that, um, we figured it would be uh, logistically challenging and a little more expensive than we might think because we'd probably end up having to subcontract out those runs. Um, and then, you know, our bus drivers aren't around, our director of transportation isn't around, you know, we're, we're all on spring break or, or whatever it is. Um, so. The committee felt that um, even though our current practice is inconvenient for those that are attending private school, we did not make, we did not want to recommend to the board that we make any changes to our current practices on that. Um, does the board have any questions about any of the options that the committee came up with? I had to say that first of all, again, this is an enormous amount of work. Can, if you're on the committee, can you raise your hand, please? I want to thank you. This is a lot of analysis and work, and I can only imagine the hours it took, so I really appreciate it. Um, I am a little confused about some of the conclusions of how much money we're going to spend. I thought because we did, when we changed the time in the morning and pushed it uh, back, that in the tail end, because of that, it cost 318 or 19000 And yet the scenario that we went back to, the old, the old schedule, we're only saving two to two and a quarter or something. So that didn't make sense to me because it seemed like we had a catalyst and we take it away, we're getting a different amount of money saved. Maude, do you want to, did you hear the question? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. So the question was, um, earlier she had asked if the, um, the cost of changing the start time is truly $318,000. And my thought process is that the cost of the four runs is $318,000, but now we're doing more of the sports runs and, there, and uh, our subcontractor is doing more of the afternoon runs, so it's not a true cost of changing the start time. Do you, do you want to expand on that a little bit? And, um, we also have more runs than we had a couple of years ago, so that would have to come into play. We have more Because when we got the, transpor the transportation report from the consultant, and I and it, I could I could be recollecting it incorrectly, but I thought that he said that the latest start time cost over the change of that cost over three hundred thousand. So it sounds like there were other mitigating factors that drove the cost up, and maybe it was more like two or two thirty five or two fifty or whatever. I do think it's important to know what that is because I think that misperception causes all sorts of energy around an issue when it might be may or may not be the reality. Um, it does seem, though, that the, the big issue is the end of the day. The beginning of the day, we have the time to do to use our team and do two runs, right? Correct. At the end of the day, it's about 11 minutes. Was there any consideration, and I know that 11 minutes, it gets dark out you know, in the wintertime, so that might make a little bit of a difference, but it's only 11 minutes, about 
potentially pushing back the elementary school 11 minutes and then there's enough time to have double runs at the end. I didn't see that, you know, you, you, the, the beginning of the day starts the same. So you don't change the beginning, you just change the end with 11 minutes in the elementary school and then you wouldn't have to do the double runs at the end of the day. This one? No. I'm not talking about changing the start of the day. If you and I don't know if this is even technically possible, so please don't wig out on me, elementary school teacher. Contractually, you can't. I, we can't now. I understand that, but I'm just saying, how we ha, was, is there a consideration that if you add 11 minutes to the end of the day, you could save a quarter of a million dollars? Oh, you're talking about lengthening the school day mm -hmm. for the elementary school. The because transportation committee did not consider going outside of what we're already contractually obligated to do. We okay. just looked at moving okay. what we can do within our current contracts. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. Yeah. On, um, on option F, uh, because if, if uh, she's was to go to 9 o'clock, which seems late to me, that wipes out any option of the elementary school teachers who commute to be able to use the commuter train, right? There's no way they would catch that. Does, if, 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 if she's moved to 825, does that put... Um, those teachers who commute uh, in a better It's position? close. It's close. So I looked that up, that same question, um, and the, the right now the Pearson pickup is at Pearson at like 305. So right now that's kind of like a non-starter for elementary school teachers. If we moved the end time to three, it'd be closer, but contractually we'd still need to come up with some sort of workaround. But it's at least it's in the realm of it's in spinning getting distance, creative. But it's not yeah. there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we, we really can't step away from the contractual obligations we have um, because our community supports the, uh, the largest part of our budget is the contractual obligations we have not only with the teachers but the TAs. That's the largest part of our contractual obligation, um, so, and that's not a small thing. I mean, we're paying people for seven hours and one minute. And you can't like start snipping here and snipping there. What you do for one, you have to do for everybody. And that's the lion's share of the budget we just looked at. So you, we can't say, hey, it, it's okay. We'll find somebody else to watch the children for the rest of the day. And it's not watching children. It's t we capture every instructional moment of every single day. So I mean, I want the commuter training to work for people, but we have contractual, we've, we've, we negotiate, we've, every contract has just finished getting negotiated. And I love our faculty, I love all of our staff, but you know, we sign contracts with all those people to live up to their obligations, and we all live up to those obligations. So it's not like, gee, you know, I want them to be able to have, to get on that commuter train too. They're working to get two trains coming out, but we've gotta live up to those contractual <laughs> obligations. Our taxpayers vote on that budget that we are living up to those contractual obligations. We can't kind of just work around a, a, con a contract. Right, but I think, I think some of us were asking the question because if, 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 a, if, if an option made that more possible, you know, that it's, worth noting. Gonna, it's worth noting it influences what we, which option we like, that's right. all. But I, I'm just putting out there that you, you can't yeah, say, oh, we're, th we're within 10 minutes, we can let X, Y, and Z person go. We can't, we can't, we can't let, you know, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not in any of the current contracts, and I wouldn't recommend it for any of them. All right, that's not what I asked, just to be clear. I asked if the option was closer. Okay, anyway. Any other questions from the board? Uh, anything that the <coughs> members would like to add on that I forgot? Go ahead. Um, actually, coincidentally, today, um, those two cars were not parked in that little spot, and we fit very nicely all of our buses. So it's pretty much a rule that you're kids are supposed to load curb to bus. We're not supposed to be loading kids from a street. It's just like when we pick them up in different places, it's that's the uh, safety. So we, we have no uh, variables in there for danger. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned that one option. We would not be able to, because when I went and looked at it, um, we would not be able to put a six bus for the high school in that loop, which would create a situation where you would have to have somebody there uh, you know, a monitor or somebody there to watch these kids that would be going on this six bus, which means that you would also be having five buses plus a mini bus traveling down the lane while you had kids. Um, and you know what I mean? That that's the situation 
uh, that the six bus would be, we would have to move the five buses out and roll that six bus in, um, which you know just creates a danger of kids running to a bus. So what she's clarifying is that if we add one run to the afternoon, that makes a sixth bus in this loop, um, which logistically is has some safety right. concerns. Right. You can't you can't you can't load kids where that six bus would be. You can't do it safely. First of all, you're blocking the road, so you just you just you would have to you would have to bring that bus in after all those kids got on. Anything else from the committee to add on? Anything I brought? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, in your presentation for this evening, which we didn't really cover in our meeting, that um, the sports runs with subcontractors are cheaper than the route runs, correct? Yes. Okay. On the route runs that we run, we have our practices in place for safety. Mm -hmm. We do not have that with subcontractors, correct? Correct. Okay. So, if the sports runs are cheaper. We have 18 buses and 14 or 15 drivers. Has anyone done a study to see if it's better for the students to use our drivers and our buses and subcontract the sports runs which don't have the crossing back and forth in the loading? I lost that last part. What do you say? On a route, mm -hmm. on a route, you have pick up and drop off. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have our practices and procedures about what's safe for the kids. Mm -hmm. Subcontractors, we have no control over them. Correct. Kids cross and they shouldn't be. Right. Okay? So what I'm saying is, would it be more economically feasible to take our sports runs where we're not picking up and dropping off, we're picking up at the school and dropping off at the school instead of stops? Would it be more economical to subcontract the sports runs and use our team of drivers and our buses that we pay for, okay, to transport our children. Yeah, that's what we're working on. That's okay. what we're trying to do, okay. right? So that's that's the goal. Okay, one last yep. question. You're showing $136,000 revenue from Sagaponic School. Is that money coming in this year? Yes. Okay. We're not fulfilling that entire run. $66,000 is being paid to another subcontractor because we don't have a suburban to pick up some of those children. That's Sagaponics Board of Education's business, not mine. So, so they're 100. paying us 136 plus 66,000. No, that that other whatever other business that's a, that's their school board's business. But the 136,000 initially was to transport their children, mm -hmm. and now we couldn't do that. So are we still getting 136,000? Yes. 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 Even though we're not doing all the children. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Go ahead. I just want to clarify, for Sharon. I think the questions that you're asking is exactly what the board asked us to do, and that's what we did. What? You asked us how you you pose to the they pose how to utilize our drivers and our resources as efficiently as we can, right. and that's what we sat in all these meetings, and we, this is the plan we came up with. So your question's been answered, I believe. I believe we're util this is right now in our current situation this is how we can most utilize our resources because we can't have our drivers drive the routes because they can't get back to the elementary school on time with 18 buses or 10 we can't because you're all right it doesn't you can't talk about how much buses you're, we have to base it on what we're currently doing in this practice and that's what we all sat down and did we're currently evaluating what our practice is what our resources are and how we can better efficiently get our kids and safely home. But we have to use right. the subcontractors, okay? But we yeah. cannot use our drivers because then your what your position you would be putting us in is going ahead and getting our high school kids home with say Harbor drivers, but four of those drivers cannot get back in time to take our elementary kids home. That's that's just the problem. This is what we're this right. is what we sat down and discussed. So in other words then with Subcontractors doing the route. They're, they're less safe. It's less safe because they don't follow our practices and procedures. Children do cross. You right. We we've, we've discussed that. Yeah. But you're still not understanding the time crunches. All of those four of those bus buses would be like ten minutes late to the elementary to pick up. So it's a new point. Okay. So. 
Uh, did you want to add on, Maude? Yeah. Every time that I see or hear about uh, Maude Talk Bus or McCoy Bus not following the rules, I'm on the phone with Maude Talk Bus immediately to, to um, get that under control. They're better now than they have been in the past. And um, it's all, it was almost daily that I would make a phone call. And if I see Maude Talk Bus, and it doesn't even have to be driving one of our students, I'm on the phone with Sandy telling them that they're doing things that are incorrect. So, All right. and I get, you know, I, I try to keep a handle on that. So if anybody out in the district sees somebody crossing the street and they call me, I immediately will call my top bus. Awesome. Thank you, Maude. Um, does the uh, board have any other questions about the options? Um, option C, I just want to because we just heard something that might conflict with this. Option C doesn't change start or end time for either school, right? So that's correct. What we do now, can we save money, be more efficient? And it says here we could potentially save 200 to 235,000, which sounds like most of what the additional cost was we could save back, right? But there's a question about whether we can line the buses up. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. So is it definitive that this is not a safe, a real safe option for us? Because it seems like this would be the easiest thing, not changing start time, end time, everything stays the same, and yet somehow we can save a quarter of a million dollars. I think that if, I think because we came up with so many options, I think the next prudent step would be um, to kind of get the sense from the board, which ones are you most interested in? Which ones are off the table? Do you want us to look deeper into these? Because with our charge in the meetings that we had, we kind of brainstormed logistical challenges, we brainstormed what we thought the cost might be. This might be enough information for the board to make a decision on what they want to do. It might be enough information to say, you know what, it's between these two or three, go vet these a little bit further, answer these concerns. I think that's kind of where we are mm -hmm. in the process. Nothing is definitive. Okay. These are just right. the options that we came up with that we're presenting to the board. So. Uh, I was thinking one more thing. I can't imagine us having a definitive answer if most of these change the timing because at the very least we want to get in, you know, input not just from parents but also faculty and staff. We don't know what the impact it would be on, on our employees and that's really important because that, that, that might cause some hardship. Any other um, questions from the board? Yeah, Does anybody have any questions for Maude? I'll let her go. What does she recommend? Uh, Maude, what was your favorite? My favorite is um, going back the way that it was, which is the 10 minute time change, because it's just five buses, They're, they all fit in the loop, it's safe. Um, they have the same driver morning and afternoon when they, you know, they, the drivers talk to the students, they know their students, and so the driver thinks they'll come small. That's my favorite. Okay. Any other questions for Maude before I let her go? Thank you, Maude. When I look You're at welcome. this proposal. Have a great night. Sorry, I couldn't be there. Oh, that's great. We appreciate you. Bye. 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 When I looked at the proposal and I went through it, and before I even got to your recommendation, I was in favor of D, of moving it back 10 minutes. I think that all of us can find 10 minutes in a day. You know, I heard what Chris said about speaking to the teachers, but they started how, I mean, we changed start time two years ago, three years ago, mm -hmm. um, and they started earlier. So putting them back, putting them back a little bit, 10, not as, not back to 7.35, but putting them back to the time of 7.40, um, I w I'm in favor of that, so. Okay, other thoughts, go ahead. I just respectfully disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's going to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, I respect Susan and her opinion very, very much. Um, but um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Medical Association, Center for D Disease Control are all on record of saying that start times before 8.30 put our kids at increased risk of depression, substance abuse, <coughs> decreased academic performance, decreased athletic performance, and we already have a start time that is 40 minutes earlier than that recommendation. And so, personally, I would be opposed to any option that moves the start back, start time to the 
middle and high school earlier. I think that's a step backwards. Um, in terms of the elementary school, I, I, I'm not opposed to a time between 8.30 and 8.50, but from what I've seen on here, I, I, I think to me, option C um, seems to be uh, the best of these proposals. So um, I love your talking points. It sounds like <laughs> the same thing I've been saying for the last I don't know how long. Uh, so I, I totally agree with Alex on this. Um, I, but I did also want to say that I loved this, the work that this committee did. I loved this presentation. I even, even emailed to you. I just loved how it looked. It makes it so understandable. Um, I also think that moving backwards just is, is the wrong direction we should be going, if anything. Uh, and I also think that if one listens to some of the parents and kind of as, as they get younger in the middle school, there's, there's uh, very solid support uh, for the direction that we've gone. So um, I thought of the, all the options, I thought both C and F uh, looked very, um, you know, looked great because they both had savings. I think uh, both addresses the issue that Maud was mentioning, where we then have our own drivers doing the afternoon runs. Personally, I was hoping that at some point we could get to the point where we could have one afternoon run for both schools and then have a, like a post club or post, you know, a late day <coughs> run, which we don't have right now. And we could do that if we could find a creative way to merge the runs. Um, so that would be my dream. Obviously, we're not there yet. Uh, it would just be great to see that at some point, because how great would it be that your kid could go to club and then take the bus home? Um, so that would be nice. But without that, I think either C or F uh, look great to me. Um, just so you know, I brought that up because I had the same thought in the committee meeting, and um, a couple of things that I didn't know is that, you know that list of everything we're legally obligated to do? If we run a late bus for our students, we have to run a late bus for all the oh, buildings. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, then so, that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? So, so I, I mean, it's worth exploring, but yeah. getting in the way of our dreams. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then I think that the issue with the six bus, I mean, I, I hear them. I, I just think we can find a way to make that work that it's safe. You know, it's, it's high schoolers and middle schoolers. So, <laughs> anybody else want to weigh in? Um, my question more is, what is the process in which we make a decision? Um, is it that we, we take a, someone puts something on the table and we're going to vote, or do we feel like there has been some suggestions of making changes, some people don't want to make changes, and so, because the, one of the options is not making changes to what we're doing, we're just going to capture more money because behind the scenes things will be different. Is, you know, do we, um, I, you know, it, it says in the presentation, I think it was a committee recommendation, to check in with the stakeholders if, before we make a change. So, um, reach out to Sec Harbor Village, Sec uh, That's, uh, after, here, let me just show you that piece. And focus so on the survey. The next, the next steps for the, the committee was if the board wanted us to do something else, then we would absolutely do something else. Um, but um, internally, we were thinking of maybe having transportation focus group um, and maybe doing a survey of some sort with the goal of trying to increase ridership on the buses to see why is it the kids aren't riding the bus. Maybe it's because they need a late bus and, and they've just got after school. So, like, so we just wanted to start that conversation with the parents mostly because they're the ones that ultimately make the decision of who gets on the bus and who doesn't or whether they drive them or whatnot. Um, and then hopefully that would arm, up, arm us with some data that we could then reach out to the village in Southampton Town and maybe start having a broader conversation about um, safe routes to school or bike routes to school or the sidewalks or you know, you know, some of these sorts of things. So that's kind of like the direction that we'd like to take our work next. Um, that's not to say that <clears throat> if you want us to vet something further, we can. So ultimately, as far as the process question, um, this is what we have for you. You can do with it what you, we, as a board, can do with it what we want. So if some people feel like they're prepared to make a decision tonight, that's kind of why I'm just kind of having the conversation with the board. If they want more information, we'll go get more information. So that's where we are. Okay. It might be nice to have a little bit of time to reflect on this and also if we have a follow-up conversation and those that might feel passionate about it from the community would have an opportunity to come and share that with them now that they've seen the options. So mm -hmm. I would suggest that we don't have come to a conclusion now and we give that opportunity. Um, and also, 
um, I do think it's important again that if we're considering changes that we also understand the impact of the you know the staff. Okay. Um, Brian, I haven't heard from you yet. Yeah, I, I think it's important to take some time to think on this information. I think the work that was done was great. It's obviously a lot of work. A question that I just had in reviewing the materials in your presentation was that if is there a way to switch some of the afternoon routes for our in-house drivers and subcontract out the less expensive routes to either the further schools or the sports? Because then it doesn't matter as much for consistency of driver, it's less cost, uh, and we have the buses and drivers. I just didn't know if that was an option that was discussed. So the, the things that we put forth are the effort to try to do that. Um, right now, as uh, Janice was explaining, we've just got too many buses on the road at the same time. They can't come back and pick up um, the other building. And so that's why we've subcontracted out our afternoon runs. So this is just try to at least. But, but there's unavailability because they're either doing maybe a BOCES run or another run. Is there thought in contact? No, there's unavailability, unavailability because they're doing the other building's runs. But we can't come back in time. Yeah. No, we I understood that yeah. on there. But C addresses that. But C that. addresses some of that. It, it, yeah, right. it does address that. In other words, it right. brings our, that afternoon run is back to our own <laughs> drivers. Right. And, and but it kind of means like if we had done that from the beginning of the year, we could have yeah. saved two could've saved I never understood hours. why they, we didn't do this from the get-go, because mm -hmm. I remember years ago when we moved the start time, we talked about that extra bus. In sure. fact, I think that was Katie's idea, right? When you know, said uh, that you know, we had this long route in Noyak, that was our longest route, is my recollection. And maybe it wasn't your day, maybe you were telling us somebody else's idea, but I remember you saying it, that if we could cut that route in half, and I think that's what they're talking about right here, right? So, um, I think when, before we got on the board, the that long run was like an hour and some change. And so the board gave the Department of Transportation a, a mandate, let's not have any run be longer than 45 minutes. And so then we've got a software program that just reconfigures everything. And so now we're doing that. We've got the one run that goes all the way down the Wayak Road, and that they just hit the road and go all the way down. Um, we're also purchasing another. But that, but that was the other thing is we we can do this sixth one if we use the bus we were going to put into reserve and keep it for one more year and out, put it on the, road. on the road. Out so there on the road. So we actually will have we'll have, we'll have, we have We'll have to hire another bus driver. Right, right. and that's the other thing is we, we didn't have any buffers. We, we have buffers. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we could had. we could possibly pull off doing C this next year and then buy another bus the year after. You know what right. I mean? And there's still an additional cost. But, yeah. but, and, and just to Chris's point, Chris was talking about you know stakeholders and you know with all due respect and um, I, I just think that C we're not changing any starter end times. So I, I don't know what the issue is with stakeholders. All we're doing is adding a bus on a run that saves us money and makes us do this more safely because we're using our own buses in the afternoon. So it just seems to me it's a no-brainer. Um, Brian, I, I didn't quite catch your uh, sentiment as far as like, do you want more time to think about oh, yeah. it? Okay. Yep. Jordana? So um, the other piece to tie in is, you know, the impacts on these options on the academic support issue that we talked about. So we have this right. handout here that kind of ties that in. Um, I like option C the best, but I would love to, alongside that, see what we can do to fix the academic support issue because the only, it, the only choice that helps solve academic support issues is D, but I think that's moving in the backwards direction with start times. So I would like to see Option C, but coupled with some sort of effort to, you know, figure out that academic support issue that we've, we've seen. Um, and then with respect to E, I don't like E, um, and the reason is just as many of us are dual income families. If you have to drop your kid off at 9 a.m., you can't get to work at 9 a.m. So um, I do not like that option E because I think our elementary school start time is late enough as it is to make it hard for those two income families to get to work. Okay. Um, I didn't see anybody supporting anything other than C, D, or F. Fair? Fair? Okay. Um, if and nobody has anything else to add at this time, um, does anybody have any uh, re uh, requests from the committee? No? All right. So we'll just plan to circle back and maybe um, revisit it at a later date.
Uh, can I make a process request? Yeah. I think we had a bunch of folks from the community come around 7.30 thinking that they'd get here in time for input one, but because we started half an hour early, they missed that. Would it be possible to kind of create input one part B so <laughs> that they can speak and then if they wanted to go home and get homework done or go to bed, they can do it because we've got young children here. Uh, are you making a motion to move public input two to right now? <laughs> no, because I think public. people might want to speak and input two after the subjects. What I'm saying is, it's a new public one, but you have to add a yeah. one B <laughs> just for this meeting to allow I'll those sure, to I'll and I'll because it started. All right, all those in favor of having public input one B right now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, public input one B. Come on up. Um, there are rules for public input. Um, would you mind pulling them up, Victoria? Um, you can talk on agenda items or non-agenda items. You can talk about whatever you would like. Uh, you have three minutes. Um, be as brief as possible. Uh, direct your comments to me. Know that you're being videotaped. Um, don't discuss any individuals. Am I forgetting anything? Me. Oh, and state your name. Okay. Um, my name is Karen Schroeder, and I am a Pearson alum, and I'm also the parent of two boys in the school district. Um, and I'm here tonight to be the voice of many, m many that are in the room, many that are not in the room, um, both parents, students, and teachers as well, who I've spoken to about this. Um, and the reason I'm here is that I do appreciate your comments at the beginning, and I don't mean any disrespect, and you know, I just didn't want to get chased out the door. Like, I appreciated what you were trying to do, and I appreciate the work you've done, but we want more. And we want to ask you tonight for more. Um, we believe that the outdoor spaces in our community are either lacking or need improvement. And um, while I have a number of concerns, and I've emailed some of the administrators here, my biggest concern is this basketball court right now, which I think was probably here when I was a student. Um, and I was at the last board meeting just to listen, and one of the things that was brought up that had me thinking was that we provide MASH part of the list of items that are safety concerns. And we have safety concerns in our own backyard that I'd like to see us address. I mean, I love the park. I want us to give every cent we can to the park. No disrespect to them. I don't want to take anything from them, but we have issues here. And another important point is that this is used all the time. And it was especially used, I wish I had a picture of what I heard happened in the fall, because the field was closed, they have no gym space, and that's it. So maybe some part of the solution is reworking the recess schedule. That might be another, you know, stick a pin in that for another day, because that's not enough. Um, and uh, so anyway, some of the concerns I have, and I know you've addressed some of them, but I'm still going to go over my list as if you didn't speak, you know, you didn't address things when we came in. Um, the asphalt is old, it's cracked, and it's filled with dirt, which makes it slippery. The court is small. Uh, it's roughly 1,500 square feet. I pasted off the other day. My son did the math. Um, 1,500 square feet. <laughs> he did, he did tonight. Um, <laughs> the average high school basketball court is 4,200, and the average elementary court is 3,100 square feet. The posts are rusty and exposed bolts. I appreciate the padding that's there. It's a huge step. The backboard edges... Well, not many kids can hit the backboard when they jump, some can, and those are very dangerous. Those actually look like maybe they used to have something around them, and now they have nothing. So those are actually really dangerous if you take a look at them. And the edge of the court is uneven, so if you were to fall out of bounds, it's, it, you know, the grass is just, it's not great. So again, while we appreciate the work that's been done, we feel that these items are Band-Aids. Um, we've had our kids sustain a number of injuries, including one student that's here who had a concussion. Because the, the ground is hard, it's unforgiving, you know, obviously accidents happen. Would he have gotten a concussion on a different court? Maybe not, maybe so, but it still is worth addressing. Um, so, you know, in, in an ideal world, we want a bigger court, we want a better surface, we want six basketball hoops, we want spaces for our kids. And this is not in comparison, it's not like we have envy for the courts going on that are happening over there, they're great, but they're, they're locked too. So that's, an, that's another issue. We need a better court here. So I hope that whatever the items that you talked about, that there'll be more, and that it will be continue, continue to be a conversation
because there's many of us that want more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the the multi-purpose courts are not going to be locked on the weekends anymore. Absolutely. We were just really waiting for things to dry out, but we're asking all parents and our Sag Harbor community to help us to keep, um, which is a policy, to keep all the um, the skateboards wheels. and everything off the yeah. yeah all the wheels off because it is that it will take up that surface. Yeah. It will really ruin that surface. Um, we hadn't considered the backboards, and we will to ha probably have a a full bigger court which that we do have debt falling off. I will not be here for that debt falling yeah. off, but we really are looking at another building project to work on the locker rooms and, and that area. Yeah. Um, and that will be within the next two years. No, that's great. I mean, yeah. it's great. It's just, I feel and like it's just something that hasn't been pointed out. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's like. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you very much. But thanks, because we thank had thought about the backboards, and that's, that's probably a smart yeah. idea. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for public input 1B? Public input won't be going once. All right. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Like, could we look at just redoing the whole thing? I just, it's, I've it, seen it's it. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a capital project. It'll be a project. It it's a capital project. It's a state. It's a whole we'll have state approval. Just you, the have, but, we, yeah. but we have capital funds, so there's two ways to go about it. Um, it it'll, it'll be a capital project, so you, you need state approval. But you really probably should wrap it up in, in a capital, because if you ever go down and see the locker rooms and okay. see the gymnasium roof, look up at the ceiling. The reason that you have those canopies there is because things are falling. Yeah. <laughs> so you real you have a bond project right there and you have debt falling off. That it's not it shouldn't impact the taxpayers between that and what you have in the capital reserve. Um, and what state ed wants you to be doing is constantly improving. And I think Karen said it right. That basketball court has been there for how many years and how many years has it been in that state? Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, poor Paul. <laughs> Welcome to Sac Harbor, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, he had a roof peel off. It's like first week on the job. He was like, oh my God, I had a roof peel off. I was like, okay. So, and as a matter of fact, Chris Tice went to a meeting and she goes, how are you on a first name basis with the people from, from the insurance agency? I was like, First year here, <laughs> so I went through the same thing. Uh, the water main break. We had a lot of things that first Yeah, time yeah. So we have an old building. We have to. It has to be constantly and kept in repair. All right. Uh, I guess at this moment we will move into the consent agenda. Yeah. Sure. Oh yes. Meet the candidate uh, is tomorrow night. Do you mind if I remind everybody? Yeah. Meet the candidate night is tomorrow night. Where's the auditorium? Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Good night, you guys. Um, all right, consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve consent agenda items uh, 6.1 through 6.3? So moved. Second. Um, we have action item seven point. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Just throw something in. Um, can I get a motion to approve action item seven point one? Second. Discussion. Can you cry? Should I read the letter? Because the public yeah. doesn't see the letter. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to do this without crying. Are you? Um, now? I am. I'm going <laughs> to do this because I have nine more months here, people and. People keep congratulating me. I'm like, really, send me a bereavement card because <laughs> I, this is terrible for me. To the Sag Harbor Board of Education, I respectfully submit um, this letter of resignation for the purposes of retirement, effective January 6, 2020. From the position of the superintendent of Sag Harbor Union Free School District, I am retiring as superintendent to spend more time with my beautiful family. I will be leaving my position in, the, in January with a heavy heart having treasured working with a dedicated Board of Education and such caring, hardworking, and professional community of educators. Every staff member in this district works every, every day to do what is best for children, their families, our school, and our community. I hope to make our next nine months together our most productive and child-centered so that Sag Harbor sails safely and successfully into the future. With warmth and gratitude, Katherine Barber Graves. Kate Graves. 
Impressive. <laughs> um, I am happy for you. I am sad for me. Uh, Katie and I were sworn in together on mm -hmm. the same day. That's right. Um, and this uh, this will also be my last year on the board. I am not running again, so uh, we will leave together as well. Um, but um, you've taught me a lot about leadership. I want to thank you for that. Um, I've learned so much serving on this board, and it's been all with you. So Thanks. I think that uh, I, I can't imagine anybody that would work harder or be more dedicated, and you will have incredibly difficult shoes to fill. So thank you for your service. And I keep wondering where I'm going to fill that other 70 hours. You might see your husband. <laughs> <laughs> you might actually have a dinner at home. Yes. And I, I was actually part of the group that, that hired Katie, and I remember that I think it was over the dinner. We all went out to dinner before we had extended the offer. And you said that your hope was that you were going to work here and make a difference and be here long enough so that when you were ready to retire, you felt like you had done the work and that this would kind of be, wasn't your first place, but it would be the last place would make a big impact. And, you know, and, and it'll be six years by the time you leave, which is, yeah. for most people that don't know, is quite a bit longer than the average superintendent who survived it and done a lot of great work and, um, and can be proud when you retire that you've left a big impact. Any other discussion? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say I'm very sorry to see you go. I will miss you. Um, and um, I know we'll still do it for a bit longer, um, but um, the amount of work that you put into this and how, what a difficult, I don't think I fully appreciate it until I was on the board, what, what a difficult job it is that, that you have. Um, and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I will miss you. Thanks. Any other discussion on the board? And there'll be more, so there'll be more tears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's something more hard to do. All right, open the boat. <clears throat> Are you getting this bigger? Um, I'm still planning on it. Actually, sure, no, we just get it. Yeah, she's already yeah, listed. The pressure is worse. So, so is it? oh, bless you. That is your net. Thank you. Um, the next action item is the contract with school leadership um, to begin the superintendent search. Can I get a motion to approve? Second. Any discussion? Do you want to map out the process after this? Or? Uh, would you like to map out the process? I just, no, I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. All right, go from the post. I would just mention that school leadership has worked with the district over the past, I think, three uh, superintendent searches. Um, they're the number one firm in the tri-state area in placing um, superintendents and senior executives within two school districts. And because they've worked in this community in the past, I think they, you know, when we, when we evaluated and we spoke to the kind of four leading firms that the subcommittee did, we felt strongly and it was kind of unanimous that they would probably best understand the DNA of the district and would be the best partner for us to find another great kind of CEO for our, for our school district. So um, we have our kickoff meeting with them May 16th. Um, and after that, we'll have a better sense of the timeline, but we've talked about making sure that they reach out to the community and the community has a chance to participate in the process as we've done in the past. So after that kickoff meeting, we'll have more to kind of share with, with the public about that process. You guys want anything else? Is that no. Okay. It was unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, can I get a motion to approve policy action 8.1? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Uh, yes, I had sent, um, I, I think it's looking really good, except that I had sent some suggested uh, changes the email to you and Jordana and um, my one concern is that we know that one of the things that because of just the unique nature of where we are and this kind of housing market in terms of how Sag Harbor works that some families will come here rent something to get their you know put their kids in the school system and then stop renting that property and go back to their home be it Shelter Island or East Hampton or wherever 
um, and then continue to shuttle their kids back and forth. And I know there was concern by some members on the board about renters being treated differently than homeowners. And so I had suggested, um, so I'm sharing with the whole board what I had shared via email with uh, Diana and Jordana, that we could add language to this that would just say that um, for uh, that uh, parents would have uh, 30 days to notify the district of a change of residency upon the end of a rental lease or upon the sale of their home. So that it's, uh, it's consistent in terms of on both owners and renters. And, um, uh, and obviously, you know, we'll resume investigations again, uh, residency, which I think is important. But this way, I think it just adds a little more teeth in terms of making sure that people are noticed that if there's a change in residency that they have to let the district know so that we, they send in the new paperwork of their um, new home if it is in Sag Harbor and obviously making a change if it's not. Did you, you served on the committee that worked on this policy, correct? Yep. Did you want to um, give your thoughts on the- Yeah, so we hadn't specifically talked about it, that issue, so I thought it was like a really good issue that Susan raised. I think where it goes is on the last page of the residency policy under um, continued registration of students slash verification <coughs> of residency. So there's that first sentence that says parents slash guardians are urged to promptly notify the district if, if there's a change of students' residence. So I think Susan's just asking to make that language stronger, saying, you know, parents shall notify. They're required to notify if they have a change in residence. And then I give the time frame. And, uh, well, yeah, I think yeah, the 30 days, and, you know, or, and then clarify that it's both for the end of their lease, so they have to let them know if the lease has ended, right, or a sale of the house, so that it's, it's fair to both. Because I know, right, I, I think I was away at that meeting, but I believe you and Alex had both raised the issue of, um, not being fit, you know, treating renters differently than homeowners. And so I thought that this way it addresses the core issue, right? Because obviously this could happen with a homeowner as well, right? Um, and so, you know, then we're treating everybody the same. And, but we're putting a little, just a little bit more teeth in it. Other than that, I thought the policy looked great, the changes looked great, and I read the law as well as what you guys did, and it, you did great work. So that was the only minor suggestion that I had. I think my only follow up to that would be. They shall do it, or else what? You know what I mean? Like when, when you, when you, I guess I, if it has more it's teeth. The consequence. Yeah. Well, the, then it would be the required to remain in the district. Is that the but consequence? It, but how do we know? But if they, well, if they don't they notify us, then there is language in there that they will, they can be charged the yeah. tuition rate. Right? I guess this issue is not only for proof of residency, right? If there's a change of address, the administration needs to know to be able to send notices. So I, I think it's broader, it's, it, you know, we do have policies that don't really have repercussions if you don't meet them, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't necessarily have them. We should have current addresses for all students. Right, but you know, this is a little different than some other policies because if you don't, if, if you don't meet the requirements, then you owe money to the district. Um, you know, right, so that's, that one is a... And, 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 and we have the unusual circumstance that our winter rentals are actually cheap. It's really expensive to get a year-round rental or a summer rental, but you can find a cheap year uh, winter rental that costs a lot less than the <coughs> And so, um, you know, so it's important to, to really be able to define this so that it doesn't get it, it's not an easy <coughs> out to really be paying tuition or legally sending your children here. Other discussion from the board? Uh, I, you know, in an earlier discussion, I think we talked about the potential of continuing to require a couple of, of different pieces of information to confirm mm -hmm. if you are a resident. And I thought we heard that you can't do that, but I looked at a variety of other districts, and one of them was Scarsdale. Someone had brought up Scarsdale, and that's kind of you know a, a district in Westchester that is um, that a lot of students and families would like their kids to go to. And I looked at their, their latest policy, and it requires two from a laundry list of proofs of residency. And so it seemed to conflict with what we were told, that you couldn't do that. So I just think it would be, be valuable to reconfirm it because this provides much more concrete evidence that someone is actually a resident and particularly because unlike most districts, we have a lot of families that pay you know, good money to send their kids here who don't live here. I think we have to be extra diligent that we're not allowing other families to go free 
and they have found a way, it seems legally, to acquire this, so I would just have us re-examine that. Well, the law doesn't say that you can't have multiple, uh, you, you can't vault, verify multiple, and I believe my recollection is that we didn't say that we were just asking for one document. It said that we, we said, may ask for more, right. but it doesn't require that we okay. get more, and they seem to be able to require it. So right, that's what but, I'm saying. But what the law, the change in the law was designed to, um, to prevent schools from asking for social security numbers right. and to prevent schools um, from, you know, uh, violating when there are citizenship issues. Right. But, so, but, but that's not what's, that, that they have things like a utility bill. You don't right, have but that's right. listed in our thing. You no, know, but this, we, we may ask for proof. Their policy says you must provide two forms of proof. So that's the difference. Okay. Well, I would agree and with you that. And, and it's very clear, and what this does is it creates a standard that treats, that, that has that same requirement. Um, you know, no matter who you are, and I think that that is, and there can be exceptions, there, and, and their policy affords the unusual exception, but that's really the exception to the rule, but I just, I had thought that I had heard at a previous conversation that we couldn't do this, and yet it seems like many districts are, so I would re-examine it. But I, I, I think that, um, I think because this is, we're, we're looking at this policy in a very, very currently, and the most current documentation from coming from our commissioner is very clear. She's put out documentation di verbiage directly to parents saying, here's what your school district can do, here's what your district cannot do. Scarsdale might not have had a conversation with our commissioner recently uh, because our, we've, waited, we've waited now multiple times with our attorneys and our attorneys have said this, and you can look at, at the attachment I sent from our, our that directly from our commissioner and that's very recent. So, um, and, and, and yeah, the, I've read this, but to me, this doesn't say you can't require two, th two of this laundry list. Yeah. Although we, I can weigh in again with our attorneys, I, I, but I've, I've asked them twice, and okay. two times they've come back with that, that you can't require two from a laundry list. Yeah, we've got a memo on it. Yeah, memo. Okay. Any other discussion from the board? Uh, Susan, would you like a motion to change the language from our urge to to shall? And uh, can we say both renters and owners? So I think Susan sent us the language that she wanted to post. Do you want to read what that well, is? Well, I just, so I just, you, you know, I mean, I wasn't like drafting formally for the thing. I, I just sent you. Um, well, the language that's in here doesn't say just renters. It says everybody. Any change in residence. Right? A everybody. I don't know that we need to say you and you. You know what I mean? It's like everybody has to do it. That was that was my here. Point. Here, no. This is this is what I sent you. Um, that parents will notify the district within 30 days of the end of a lease or sale of a home on their residency status within the district. That's that's what I sent. So, and I have the policy up right in front of me, and just if we change two words, it might satisfy what you're requesting. So, it said it currently says. Parents, guardians are urged to promptly notify the district if there is any change in students' residence, either within or without, with, without of the district. Right. right? So, so if we change it from our urge to, to, to shall, shall within 30 days. Right. I I understand what you're saying. I just think somehow we have to add, somehow incorporate lease or sale. You know, I, I just think it's that rental thing it has to get out there. That if your lease is coming to an end after 30 days of that end. You have to send us what your new lease is. Only if they move, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, obviously if they renew. No, also if they renew the lease, oh, and if they I renew the lease at the same place. I disagree place. with that. I, I, well, that I, gets back to the debate of how often do you need to confirm, right? Right. So if, if somebody's on month to month or year to year, they shouldn't. If I move, oh well. If I move, that's one thing. Okay. All but right. if if I'm on a month to month with my landlord, or a week to week with my landlord, or a year to year with my landlord, I think it's only if I move that I should notify you. But I think the challenge, I think the challenge we've heard before is, what's the incentive to notify the district if you didn't renew and you're now living in another? You, if you want your kids to still come here, are you really going to draw the court that you're no longer a resident, right? So that's when you had brought up, well, maybe they need to, we need to require that they reconfirm because they have absolutely no incentive to tell us that they are no longer living here. I mean, that, and I think that's what's happened quite a bit. I know families that have done that. So, so I, I think that's why you had brought up the confirmation over a period of time. 
Well, the other thing is, I know you all added the confirming residency. Obviously, everybody does it when they enroll, right? And then I think it was, what, third grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade? Mm -hmm. We have none in high school, so maybe we should add it again in 11th grade? No, I, yeah, ninth, ninth grade is high school. Yeah, I know ninth grade is high school, but I'm saying add it again so that they have to confirm that they're all still residents when the kid hits 11th grade. That's another way to do it. Go ahead. It just seems like we're going off in a lot of different directions. I thought the suggestion, which sounded like a good one, was to change the language where it now reads, shall. parents and guardians are urged to parents and guardians shall. Um, now it seems like we're talking about something different than that, but I, I think if that was what the change was, parents, guardians shall, shall promptly notify the district if there's a change of the student's residence, either within or without the district, that would cover the circumstances we're talking about. Well, that's what I was trying to get at, because she had brought it up. I'm yeah. fine no, with it no, the way I, it is. Yeah. So if that satisfies, if that's the motion, but if it's well, something can else. Well, we add within 30 days of a change of residency or something like that? I just, again, I think there's just Well, that would be less strict than promptly, right? Well, no, be, well, well I, promptly, promptly is no, is, what, right, promptly right. to you might be different than promptly to me, right? Okay, so, so, so parents it. shall Within, within 30, 30 days, days notify. notify the district. Okay, that sounds reasonable okay. to me. Um, are we, okay. if, I, if I just need to get the will of the board because... I'm okay with that. I just want to put that out there. That I was really thinking it was important to get a little more teeth because of the issue here. And I just hope that we are going to, with the change of this, we'll start resuming investigations because I think that's important. Yeah. It's about protecting the taxpayers' dollars and being fair we, to people um, who are paying. We have, we have been investigating right along. I, I don't want anybody that's out there and that's not true. We work always consistently. The, the principals and I, we, are we doing like we're, we're hiring somebody? No, but we, we make those very, very difficult phone calls all the time. So, but the only change now is that our, um, our attorneys have said hire an outside people to do those investigations because um, first it's best for students that you don't want your security people you know uh, doing the investigations because those are the people that our children see every day right. and number two it, be, it could become litigious yeah, so true. and and it's work that's the best practice in other districts mm -hmm. but we you know Jeff and I made a phone call two weeks ago mm -hmm. I mean so there's you know it's, it's a very it's, and it's, it, it breaks your heart and most people go thank you Okay, and they, and they move. And they make the switch. Uh, can I get a second on the motion on the floor? I'll, I'll second it. Okay, any discussion on the motion on the floor? Uh, Victoria, do you have the motion? So I have to, um, from, to change the language from parents and guardians are urged to, to shall within 30 days notify the district. Correct. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? Just, are we just discussing it for the purposes of our next read or can we for the next this read. tonight if we all uh, agree with if you want to make a motion change if you want to make a motion after that we can mm -hmm. adopt it yeah. but yeah we can make it any other discussion me. on the change all right all those in five up in favor thank you um do you want to make a to move to adopt the residency policy with that change? What we have in here is adopt. It reads, approve second reading of... No, I mean contact. adopt the policy, not just the second reading. Usually with the two readings and you adopt the next meeting. So do, do we have like to? to? You, you don't have to. But you don't have, no, no, you don't have to, but I was just saying yeah. that that's why it doesn't say adopt because yeah. procedurally we usually do two readings and then adopt at the final. Okay, so now there's a motion on the floor to adopt it as amended. I'll second. Any other discussion? Uh, yeah, the uh, Katie, when you referred to, when I brought up my suggestion earlier and you referred to maybe they are not reflecting the law, um, the most current law, are you talking about section 100 point, this one, that this is written about? 
a lot that's, of it. That's what the commission wrote to the right. parents. I'm right. just I'm just saying because in here they reference that because of the law change, this is their new policy. So I would really I'm I'm confused as to why we are not requiring. Um, I'm just taking the advice of our attorneys, okay. and, and they may have a different set of attorneys that interpret something differently. Okay. He did write a memo to the whole board. No, no I know, but I, 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 because I've found many districts that seem to have updated it and included the challenge we have, and we've talked about this before, is anyone can print a lease, have their friends mm -hmm. sign it as their landlord, that's all you need, and now you're going to school here and you live 20 miles away. And so I don't. I think the way it's written, it's almost wasted paper because so, anyone can so do that. So Chris, if I can interrupt, I, I I live in this school district and I and I and I I'm the chief officer of the school district. If I saw that, I just I really don't want us campaigning here. I and putting that in the newspaper. We do not. We are not seeing that level of people doing okay. that and taking from the school district. We have a million dollars worth of people tuitioning in. We, I would go. I would look for that kind of funding. I uh, we are. Not, I have not worked this hard to bring tuition in to give our resources away. So, also what we're also seeing in the Lower Hudson Valley is where they have they have paid no attention to the commissioner, and they go ahead and make people completely um, re um, re sign up for school district again. And the commissioner has gone after them for their policies and said, you can't do that. And they, those superintendents, those boards have completely ignored the commissioner. So I'd be very careful looking at Scarsdale when I know Scarsdale was hit by the commissioner just this past year. And there was like front page newspapers where they're making people completely reestablish their residency, mm -hmm. not just free up. So, um, okay. so and, but let's not create a problem that really doesn't exist because if we're bringing in a million dollars worth of tuition, we're obviously vetting everybody that's here. And people, it's a very small town. If you want to know, I have sometimes called a snow day and found out we had a snow day 15 minutes before I called it. <laughs> so people tattle on each other. You know, so when we, when the administrators and I have found that someone has moved out, I've usually found out from six different sources that somebody's moved out of town. Um, and it, so it's not just one person's told us, we've heard it from multiple sources. So um, uh, it's, it's a very small town. Any other discussion on the motion on the floor? Do you have your first and second on Jordana's? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is to adopt. So we don't need to do the second, do we need to do the second no, read? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I have six yes and Susan Schaefer abstained. Um, public input two. Is there anybody for public input two? Come on. Did you hear the rules from before? I think I got this. <laughs> 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 I'm down already. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Okay, so I'm going to talk to you first from what I see right now with my bus driver hat on. As I said today, we had five buses in our line. Everything rolled smoothly. We had all the things. The one thing that we come into uh, every single day is kids, are you going to play sports? Are you going on to the bus? Are you going here? Is your mom picking you up? We have kids all in that little area. So now if we decide we want to add that six bus, now you're going to have a bunch of kids on the side, and you're going to have one person probably trying to corral probably about 25 kids to stay put, let alone Bobby talking to whoever about what's going on later, and then all of a sudden his bus is rolling, so now he's chasing a bus. So we already have kids chasing buses, already with just five of us there, and now you're going to have potentially five buses moving out, actually six with a minibus, and another bus running in. So as a parent, 
I would plead with the board members to please strongly consider the 10 minute option. I understand the pediatric concerns and everything, but we are talking about 10 minutes to save taxpayers a lot of money. And also, I would hate to be in any of your shoes, God forbid, a kid got hurt or got hit by a bus because we couldn't, we couldn't do a 10 minute change. I think we have to go to the core of our values and what the more important thing is, is our kids. And when we all discussed this, it was actually two to four, four being in favor of the 10 minute time change. I think it's really important that we consider that we would knowingly go into a situation putting kids at risk. And that would be on you guys. I mean, I'm speaking frank. So anytime you have buses moving, you have potential for kids to get hurt. And you're staging kids, and then you're moving buses, knowingly doing that every single day. So as a taxpayer, as a parent, I'm pleading with you to keep what I'm hoping all of you keep as your highest values is safety. And then also due diligence to taxpayers on saving a lot of money and making the right decision for the whole entire community. People that don't have kids. People that are having to sell their homes because they can't afford it. <coughs> that's my piece. Thank you. Anybody else for public input two? Public input two. All right, so we had a uh, couple of items on the agenda that were not scheduled. Um, first one was a contract for the plumbing. Can I get a motion to approve <coughs> agenda item 12.1? Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? Okay, can there be a public explanation of what this is so people know what we're voting on? Do you want to do that, Dr. No. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for the question. Um, we put out bids for the Sag Harbor Learning Center renovation work, and uh, the first round of bids resulted in no. Uh, plumbing contractors coming forward uh, submitting a bid. So as a result, we rebid that one particular item, and um, we opened bids last week at the appointed date and time. And uh, this particular company, Hershey Company LLC, came in at the lowest responsible uh, base bid amount and the alternative. We then uh, submitted all the documentation to. IVI group, or architects, who uh, conducted an interview uh, and conducted a background check on this particular company and uh, then made recommendations to us to, uh, to proceed with this firm and uh, put it on the schedule tonight for tonight uh, for board approval. And this is for all of the um, plumbing work that needs to be done at the Sag Harbor Learning Center. Uh, for a base bid amount of $1,073,000 and the alternate of $44,000 to uh, have the kitchen ready uh, for whenever the board decides to proceed and install the kitchen equipment. Well, um, can you remind us what was uh, the projected budget for this versus to compare? Because you said it came in under budget. It would be nice to know, if, you know what it was originally budgeted for. It was... Uh, off the top of my head, it came in about nineteen thousand dollars under budget. Okay. <coughs> Any other discussion? I'm still unclear as to why just prepping the kitchen is considered phase two. I thought, you know, the professional kitchen was phase two. It's so not. It's not. This is the bond project. This is right. No, I know, two. but it said in the in the document. Unless I'm confused no, with, with which document. I thought this is the plumbing bid that had the add alternate for the kitchen. Right. So if, if this is all part of the bond project. So if the bond project, so we have like a 20% buffer, so that if anything goes over, we're good. Um, and right now everything's is is not going good. Everything's <laughs> under. Um, so if they have funds left over. We, on a bond project, you don't get to return it to the community. You have to spend everything that's in the scope of the bond. So one of the add alternates would be, that, so add alternate means you just add that as an alternative, is to purchase, this, to finish the kitchen. To do the fittings of the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Just to finish the kitchen. 
Right, so that's okay, not when phase you say two. finished, yeah, but on, on their document it said uh, phase two add alternate on, on their document. Unless I read it It doesn't wrong. say phase two. I thought that in the. Um, yeah, here it is. open it. So it's, it's, not add, it's an right. add alternate. Add alternates are part of your bond project because you have to, it, you can't ret like return it. Like you would disperse funds. If your vo the voters of the community voted on, that's the that's the total amount to spend. Where did you see phase two? I didn't Here, see that. Um, okay, no, it's on the letter. It's on the letter of the contractor. And, um, it's an alternate. It's an alternate. Yeah, alternate PC one. So I think I, when I was reading, I think I interpreted that as phase two. My apologies. No. But then it just says kitchen fit up. So it's just prepping the kitchen, and it's not no. Appliances, and this does not mean the kitchen is done and ready to use for professional use. Right. Correct. Okay. I, I, just, I just want to be clear on what we, you know, because I just felt like, at least for me, I wasn't clear when we had the whole roofing thing. So I'm just trying to make sure we have clarification on what we're. Okay. I also wanted to mention that this particular firm is out of based out of Shelter Island, so it's all local labor. Oh, that's great. Right, that's The last thing that I would just like to add is that it is Teacher Appreciation Week, so everybody should make sure that they express appreciation for their child's oh. teachers. Um, and can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Can I add one thing? Um, I want to thank the PPSA and the leadership, and I see we have the president back there. It was a new event Friday night, which was a talent show, which was a wonderful showcase for the students. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, and they worked, the, the leadership did an unbelievable job of pulling this together, the prizes that existed, the, the baskets, the auction, all of that. And to see the kids' faces light up, um, you had adults really and kids excited. together. It was really, and you had, and I saw students up there that don't normally do performing arts within our formal programs, and it gave them an opportunity to do their own genre and their own thing, lots of different, and it was really, it was, a, a, I thought, a beautiful family night, and so many people said, you know, how nice it is that I, the school has an event where, like, no matter how old or young you are, I think there was even a few little babies there, um, they weren't performing on stage, uh, but that, that it was just a great family night. So, so I want to thank you. And, the, thank you. And we had alumni that. come back too. Yeah, and then that. tomorrow night, you're also helping host the um, the Meet the, the Candidates night. night. And two of the candidates are here tonight. So good luck tomorrow night. Plus, did we get a first? I got a first. I need a second. I'll second it. Um, and then if the board could just stick around, I just have uh, some calendaring issues that I need to um, just while we're all here. Thank you. Thank you. Administrators, sit out.